Right. Annie Duke, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. So you just published a book called Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. And this is a topic that I'm I'm thinking about all the time. Like, how can I make good decisions when I don't know everything? And your book was like paradigm shifting for me. A lot of great insights. Oh, and, thank you. And I'm being sincere. I mean, it was, I've been telling all my friends about this book that they need to check it out. What's interesting, you, you have an interesting background. You started off when you were in college, you were in gr- doing graduate studies. You got a fellowship doing cognitive psychology, but then you took a break from that and had a 20 year career in professional poker. So what's the backstory there? And then how did you, you then you eventually kind of came back to cognitive psychology after poker. So, yeah, so actually, top secret, I came back to college, uh, cognitive psychology during poker, which is something that, you know, wasn't my more public facing life. But let, let me get back to the beginning. So, yeah, I went to Columbia undergraduate. Then I went on to University of Pennsylvania to study cognitive science with a National Science Foundation fellowship. And I was there for five years. I mean, I, I went through the whole thing. I got my master's and I was actually on my way to becoming a professor. So much so that I already had all of my job talks lined up. And during my last year in graduate school, I've been struggling with some stomach issues and that kind of came to a head actually as I was on my way to my first interview up at NYU. And I, I got really, it, they really came to the fore and I got really sick and I actually ended up in, in the hospital for two weeks. So I had to delay going out on the market. And in academics, the job market is seasonal. You don't just, you know, any time you apply, you really only apply in the spring for the start of the, you know, the academic year in the, in the fall. So I had to wait for a year. So during that time, while I was recuperating, I was sick. And so I couldn't really teach to make money. And, you know, I just needed money because I didn't have my fellowship then because I was taking time off. And I was, I had actually gone to Montana with my then husband in order to recuperate. And my brother, who Howard Letterer, who was already a professional poker player at that point, suggested to me that for money, I could go play in some poker games that were legal in Montana at the time. So off I went and I thought, okay, well, I'll try this out and I'll see if I can make some money in the meantime while I'm waiting to go back out onto the job market the next year. And you know, I always joke that the meantime ended up being 20 years. So I, I started playing, that was in 1992. I declared myself to be a professional, which I guess means like that's what I was writing on my taxes in 1994. And I retired from the game in 2012. So it was a very long meantime. <laughs> so and uh, since then, since you've retired, what have you been spending your time on and working on? Well, what I've been spending my time on is actually what I was doing in parallel to the poker playing from 2002 on. So in 2002, I had the very good luck of somebody asking Eric Seidel, who is an amazing poker player. He's actually a big character in my book. He shows up a lot in there, but he's an incredible poker player. He has like $38 million in, in tournament winnings. And he got asked by a friend of his to come and speak to a group of office traders about the way that poker might inform how you think about risk. So that wasn't so crazy that Eric got asked to do that because Eric in another life had actually been an options trader. And so this was something that he knew through that life. And lucky for me, Eric really hates any kind of public speaking at all. So he recommended, he said, why don't, I don't want to do it, but why don't you ask Annie Duke to do it? Uh, she actually used to, you know, teach in college, and I think she might be better suited for this. And so I got the call, and that was the first talk that I ever gave, where I really had to think in a really clear way about these issues of how do you make better decisions, how does uncertainty really muck the system up, how do you figure out how what future you're supposed to bet on, and think about how do you actually communicate that to another person, which is a whole different problem than actually sort of executing these skills at the table. It's actually really interesting to try to figure out like, how am I supposed to communicate these things that I'm kind of doing at the table in a way that another human being could then understand and actually learn from uh, and being able to execute on themselves. So that, that idea of how do you teach it really helps clarify your own thoughts. So that was in 2002. And you know, I, I say that there are these moments in my life where I kind of have these aha moments. And I would say one of them was definitely when I sat down at a poker table and started playing where it, it, that was a big aha moment for me of, oh my gosh, this is really the kind of problem that I love. 
And it seems to be a really interesting and practical application of the things that I was studying in cognitive psychology. And wow, like so much. I mean, I really just felt it deep in my soul that this was something that I wanted to be doing. And I think that when I gave that talk, that was another aha moment of remembering the joy that I felt in teaching. So uh, I wanted more, you know, it was, wow, this, it's so cool when you're up and you're giving a talk because it really is a, a conversation. You're trying to have the right conversation with the audience and you're seeing what the audience is responding to. It clarifies your thought. It changes the way you think about the world. It changes your mind in the most beautiful way. And then you talk to people afterwards and it's just, it's, I, I just love it. And so anyway, from that, that, that particular hedge fund manager actually started recommending me to other people. And so for, for the next two years, I would get these occasional recommendations coming in to be talking on the, these topics. And then about two years in, I said, you know what? I really like it when people occasionally call me. I'm going to start intentionally building this business. And I would say that I started intentionally building it right around 2004, probably. And from there, actually built a very big kind of side, you know, business that I was doing that obviously wasn't on television. That wasn't really what I was known for. But so by the time 2012 rolled around and I left poker, I already had this other part of my life, which I was actually at that point, a bigger part of my, uh, really a bigger part of my life. And that, that's what developed into the book was, you know, all that speaking that I've been doing since 2002. Right. So you basically consult and teach people and businesses how to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, Oftentimes when we think about decision making, there's often a, we often make analogies to games. And some people say, oh, you know, life is a game of chess and the decisions you make, you make one decision, you see what the next person's decision is, you know, move is and then so on and so forth. But you argue that no, life isn't really like chess or the decisions we make in life isn't like playing a game of chess. It's more like poker. Why is poker a, a better symbol for decisions in life compared to some other game? Yeah. Basically, here here's the, the problem with using chess as a model for the kinds of decisions that we make in life is that chess is a very constrained problem, meaning there just isn't a lot of uncertainty in it. There's a very little bit of luck. And really, if you I mean, there's no hidden information in the sense that you can see all the pieces sitting right in front of you. So I have access to your whole position. Now, there's certain things I don't have access to, like I don't know what openings you've recently been studying, for example. But as far as the pieces, as they lay, I can see all of those. And in terms of the luck element, you know, there's nobody rolling the dice. And then if it comes up, you know, nine, I get to take your bishop off the, the board. So there's just, there's almost no luck in that game. So what that means is that it's a very different problem than most of the kinds of problems that we have to tackle in life. Life is much more like poker where there is lots of hidden information. The cards are face down and the relationship between your decision quality and the way that an outcome might turn out on a single try is actually quite loose. So I'll give you an example that's actually a relatively high skill example in life where you can really see how this looks much more like poker than it does like chess. So have you ever in your life run through a red light? Yes, I have. Have you done it more than once? No, it was like, I can't, uh, maybe, I, I know once for sure I have. I've done it, was, it more than it, once. It, right, it was when <laughs> I was trying to beat the yellow light and I ran the red light. Right, or, I mean, I imagine that there have been times when you didn't see that it turned red or you've never done like the three in the morning and you're, the light's taking forever and you're looking and you're seeing that nobody else is coming. I, I'm such a shot. sheep, I have not done that. I'm like, I'm obeying wow. the law, yeah. <laughs> okay, I haven't either. I have friends who have done that. Right. I know people who have done that, yes. Yes. So so when you happened to run that red light, did did a cop pull you over and give you a ticket? No. No. That's interesting. Did you get in an accident? I did not. No, you went through the red light just fine, right? Yes. Isn't that interesting? So I uh, so me too, by the way. I've never had anything happen to me when I went through a red light. So here's my question for you. I've only ever had good outcomes uh, running red lights. Do, do you think that makes running red lights a good decision? Um, pr well, pr I'm, I'm going to say no. <laughs> um. <laughs> and in fact, despite the fact that I've had some good outcomes, I actually do not try to, I mean, I'm not attempting ever to run a red light. Right. So 
I, d- I don't even do it at two in the morning. I mean, I was just using that as an example. But if, if, if I happen to run a red light, it's generally accidental and rare. So, so here, here's the issue is that if, you know, in a game like chess, because there, there isn't this hidden information issue and the luck uh, has such a small influence on, on the outcome of any game, it's kind of like if you ran a red light, you would get at least a ticket every single time. Because in chess, if I make bad decisions, if I make bad moves, now, now, you know, that's going to result in me losing the game, assuming that the choices that I make are worse than yours, right? Now in poker, that's not true. In poker, I could make terrible decisions in comparison to you. We could be playing poker and I could make every decision that I make could be worse than yours and I can still win the hand. That, that can't happen in chess. If I make worse decisions than you in chess, I will lose. It's just, that's just true. So what that means is that as we're looking at how are we supposed to model the way that we're supposed to think about decisions, we have to take into account that in, in life, there's lots and lots of hidden information. There's lots of things we can't see. There's lots of information that we don't have. We can't see the other person's position. We can't see our own position very often. And we know that whatever decision we make, there are lots of possible futures that could occur, some good, some bad, some with higher probability, some with lower probability, but we can't know how it's going to turn out. And it causes this particular issue, which is that if we know what the outcome is about a decision that's occurring in life, we can't necessarily work backwards to what the decision quality is based on that one outcome. We can if we have you know 10,000 outcomes, but not if we have one. Whereas in chess, that's a, a relatively reasonable strategy. So in chess, if you say to, you know, if you say to me, Hey, I lost a game, then I know that probably your decision quality in that game was not good. Certainly not in comparison to your opponents, right? I can make that link. But in poker, if you tell me, Hey, I lost a hand, I actually don't know very much about your decision quality. And that's true of most decisions in life. If, if I say to you, Hey, I got through a light safely, that doesn't necessarily mean that I followed all the rules of the road. I could have done that just fine without doing it. Gotcha. So I mean, this you raise an interesting point because you say you're making the case that in life, most of the decisions we make involve luck. But I would say, you know, in America, I think there's this idea that, well, uh, I don't believe in luck or I make my own luck or in, in, and people think they can just kind of bootstrap themselves to success. And then they, you know, they read, well, look at this guy. He started from nothing and ended up the top because it was just hard work and he made his own luck. Are you saying that's like, that's a faulty way to look at the world? I don't think it's a faulty way to look at the world. I think it's a faulty way to understand luck. So let me explain what I mean by that. Sure. You can improve the probability that you will have good outcomes by improving your decision-making. But that is not making your own luck. That is increasing the chances that you have a good outcome. So you can't guarantee that things will turn out well. And you, even though you might have made decisions that increase the probability that you have a good outcome, you cannot guarantee it. You cannot make luck go your way. So it's this idea of incrementally increasing the chances that things go well for you. And that hopefully those things play out over time. So if I'm somebody who's making decisions where I'm going to have a really good outcome, you know, 55% of the time, and you're making decisions where you're going to have really good outcomes 62% of the time, I'd rather be you. But you didn't make luck. You made better decisions that then increased the probability that good things will happen. But neither of us have any control beyond that. Once, once we've made the decision, and we're hurtling ourselves to some set of futures, each of which have some sort of, you know, some probability associated with them, we have no control beyond that. I I can have a coin that's going to flip heads 50% of the time and flip tails 50% of the time. And I can know that, right? And I can know exactly what the probability is. And that doesn't mean that I know whether it's going to flip heads on the very next flip. And that's what life is like. And I think that when people say I make my own luck, they're acting like somehow you... I know better than you that it's going to land heads. And I don't think that that's true. And I think that having that kind of realistic view of the fact that all we can do is increase the probability. We can't do anything beyond that. We never have any control of luck. I think a lot of really good things come out of that because I think it does drive you to be a better decision maker. And I think the other thing it does is it creates a lot more compassion in the world 
because one of the things that I think comes out of this idea of, well, you make your own luck is that if people have a bad outcome, there's this idea, well, if you had just worked harder, it would have worked out for you, you know, and this much more sort of ownership of your own successes than necessarily maybe is, is rational for you to take. And I think that both of those things actually really hurt us. So, you know, one of the things that they talk about, of course, is like survivor bias. And I think that make your own luck idea really contributes to survivor bias. So survivor bias is that when we're reading case studies of, you know, we're reading the books of people who are telling you their, their secrets to getting rich, you're reading the people who have succeeded. Nobody's buying a secrets to getting rich book from somebody who has failed, but that person might have actually had a better strategy than the person who succeeded. I think a a good place to sort of see that is to look at outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's book, outliers, because he really talks about like timing, right? That there's a lot of things that have to do with timing. If you look at all the people who made their fortunes in computers, they were all born around the same time. People who came out of college during the great depression, they didn't do so well. But they might have had great strategies and been great decision makers. They just, you know, there were things that were under there that weren't under their control. And I think it's just a more rational way to look at the world. And and I think it causes you to focus in much more on decision process and become much less out, much less outcome oriented. I like that. I like that a lot. And also, it's you know, it's compassion for yourself too. If things aren't going your way, you might be doing everything you're supposed to be doing, making the right decisions. But there's some factor that is out of your control. Like you shouldn't feel so down on yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I always like to say that we should probably spend less time beating ourselves up, but also less time patting ourselves on the back so hard, right. <laughs> you know, and I think that that just creates a much smoother existence. And I think it does create a lot of compassion for yourself. And I think that when you do that, you also create a lot more compassion for other people. And I think that you're happier when you're able to do that, when you're able to see that other people might have had bad outcomes. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they were uh, bad decision makers or that they deserved it. You know, I, I think that that's also a really tough way to live. So I, I'm all for compassion all around. Yeah, definitely. So here's the question. So if there's the outcomes of decisions are based on the quality of our decisions or skill, and then there's luck, how do you figure out if your results were due primarily to skill or luck? I mean, it sounds like you wouldn't be able to find that out just looking at one example. It sounds like you'd need multiple examples so you could eventually suss that out. Yeah. So here's this, I think this is going to be a little bit counterintuitive. So in most things in life, we don't have enough data to be able to to get a big enough set of outcomes in order to be able to tell much, right? I mean, it's kind of the problem of like, you're usually getting like, you know, a few flips of the coin, you're not getting 10,000. So how do you then derive what the coin looks like if you don't have very much, very many outcomes? And, you know, it feels like this really big problem. So what, what I would say is that the secret to trying to figure it out is to actually try to separate outcomes from decisions as much as possible. So the issue is this, is that it, it, there is hidden information and, and we don't know what we don't know. And, you know, we process the information that we have in very particular ways. And then there's luck in, in it that gets into the mix. And so it's all very opaque. Looking into the quality of a decision, it's, it's just hard. And what, what really, really makes that hard is when the outcome is already known. Then it becomes almost impossible because the weight of the outcome, you know, the, basically the sort of, let's call it the cognitive size of the outcome overshadows everything else. And we can all, it's like, we can only see the outcome and we're trying to make the decision process fit with that. So what we actually want to do is be analyzing our decisions in absence of outcomes as much as possible. So let me give you an, an example, hopefully that's going to make this a little bit clearer. Okay. So, so I actually opened the book with this example. Uh, so it's 2015. And the Seattle Heat Seahawks are on the one yard line of the New England Patriots and it's the Super Bowl. And you know, it's the Super Bowl because the New England Patriots are there. So obviously it has to be the Super Bowl because they're always in there. Anyway, so there, the Seattle Seahawks are on the one yard line, 26 seconds left. It's second down. They have one timeout and they are down by four against the New England Patriots. Now people probably remember what happens next. 
Pete Carroll calls a pass play. Russell Wilson passes the ball. And it gets intercepted by Malcolm Butler in the end zone. And the game is over. Of course, everybody was expecting him to hand off the ball to Marshawn Lynch. So now we we have an outcome now, right? Which is interception, loss of game. What happened the next day was really spectacular. Uh, And actually what happened even during the game, you can hear Chris Collingsworth calling this. And, you know, the ball gets intercepted and, and he really comes down on Pete Carroll. Like he can't even believe that, that this was the call. And then the next day, the headlines, you know, they seem to be sort of having an argument about whether it was the worst call in Super Bowl history or the worst call in football history, period. What was interesting was there wasn't a lot of like, oh, well, maybe the decision was pretty good, but they just got unlucky and had an interception. There was a little bit of it. So there was a writer on Slate who made that argument. Also, Benjamin Morris over on 538 made this argument. Subsequently, uh, a couple of years later, Bill Belichick even made the argument that it was actually a pretty good play. But nobody thought that. And even today, really, nobody thinks that. And when I get up in front of audiences and I show the clip of this play, even after I explain some of that reasoning, which we can go into if you want to, I don't, I don't know if you want to go into the reasoning, but even after I go into the, some of the reasoning, you know, people still argue with me about it. The main thing that is really important to know about that play call is that the chances of an interception there are only between one and 2%. So it's tiny. So an interception there was a very unlucky result. It was a very, very, very low probability future to have occurred as a result of this pass play. And they got a lot in return for that one or 2% uh, interception rate that they might be paying, but it's really low. Now, once you know how low that interception rate is, one would think that the idea that it's the worst play in, call in Super Bowl history might go away. Because you, just, you know that there, there, clearly there was a tremendous amount of luck in the way that that turned out, but it doesn't. And the reason that it doesn't is because you know the outcome. So let me do a thought experiment with you so that we can see how knowing the outcome really mucks up our ability to analyze these things. Let's imagine that there's 26 seconds left and the team is on the one yard line and Pete Carroll calls a pass play, and it's caught in the end zone for a touchdown. And the Patriots fail to score in however many few seconds they have left, and the Seahawks win the game. What do you think the headlines would have looked like the next day? Gutsy call, greatest call ever. Amazing. Right. And we kind of know that. Because did you? I don't. If you watch the Super Bowl this year, what were the headlines about Doug Peterson and the Philly Special? Yeah, yeah, it was all that. Yeah, right. He was brilliant. Right? So let's do the reverse thought experiment there. Because remember, everybody was expecting them to go for the uh, field goal there. So that now the Philly, it's the end of the second quarter, and they're it's fourth and one, last play of the quarter. Everybody's expecting they're going to go for a field goal. They do this crazy Philly special situation where Nick Foles. The quarterback manages to catch a, you know, catch a pass in the end zone. So imagine that that pass had been intercepted and that Philly had gone on to lose the game. What do you think people would have been saying about that play call? That they did not go for the field goal. Worst call ever. Should have done it. Yeah. Okay. So when you ask me, how is it that we're supposed to figure out what's due to luck and what's due to skill? And this is, again, counterintuitive. The first step is to isolate yourself from the outcome of the decision as much as possible. So because it just it just ends up distorting everything. It's like a huge gravity well on your decision analysis, right? It just it's like putting blinders on. You can't see past it. So there's two ways to do that. One is as much as possible really analyze the decision in advance of the outcome. So you could imagine for example if you're doing strategic planning to Really think through that strategic plan in a in a real way. Imagine what the possible outcomes are, all the possible outcomes are, assign probabilities to them, put action plans in place for trying to increase the probabilities of the good outcomes and decrease the probabilities of the bad outcomes and memorialize it. You know, put it on a whiteboard, take a picture, pass it around, pin it to your whatever, <laughs> like make sure that you have that so that everybody can see it. So that when the pass gets intercepted, you can look at that and you say, look, we took that into account. There's the 1%. So you know it's there in advance. That's one thing that you can do is do as much as possible before the outcome. But sometimes the outcome has already happened. And in that case, 
go find some people who have been quarantined from the outcome, who don't know the outcome, and talk to them as if it's a brand new decision. And don't tell them what the outcome is. Just talk to them as if you're talking to them about a brand new decision. And that's going to be really the first step in terms of digging down into you know, what's a good decision, what's not, what has to do with luck, what doesn't, where can we change the decision process, what information could we have been seeking that maybe we didn't know, and start getting more into the skill portion of the game, right? And not getting so overshadowed by the luck portion of the game. Gotcha. So detach yourself, avoid resulting. I think that's what they call it in poker, where you just look yes, on the results. right. To- so, and the best way to avoid resulting is to not know the result. Yeah. That's a really good way to avoid resulting. If I don't know the result, it's very hard for me to be a resulter. So, so you mentioned an interesting point when you're calculate when you're trying to figure out whether your, your decision process is a sound one, a good one. One of the things you suggest is to assign probabilities to different outcomes. From what I understand, like humans are really bad at probabilities. Like we're actually like we're not like we're t- absolutely terrible at it. So how do you go about? assigning probabilities to things you don't know are how are they're going to like, you know, basically I'm trying to think of like a life decision. Like, should I go to this college? Right. There's a lot of unknown factors going on. So how do you sure. assign probabilities to that? The step one is stop worrying about whether you've got the right answer. So I, what I feel like is a, a lot of people don't want to assign probabilities to things because they're afraid they're going to get it wrong. And I like to think about it from the frame of the only way to get it wrong is to not try. So, because here's the thing, let's agree that if you choose a particular college, the probability of you liking that college is not 0% or 100%. Does that seem fair to you for me to make that assertion? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. So if it's not 0% or or 100%, it's, it's definitely some probability in between. So, Take your best guess because your best guess is better than the default because there's, there's kind of like only two ways that the default can go, right? The default is either you're acting like you're a hundred percent sure it's going to be great or 0% or it's like, well, I'll like it or I won't. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe you're thinking everything's like a 50, 50 shot or something like that. So but the fact is that it's none of those things, right? There, There is some probability that you're going to like it. We know it's not zero or 100%. So just take a stab. Try to get somewhere in the middle because that's better than nothing at all. So it's more right than not trying to do it at all. Even if it's a range, right? Even if you say, this is really hard for me. I really don't know. There's just a lot of factors. So I'm like between 30% and 70% of the time. I think I'm going to like this college. That's still better. You narrowed it down. You're doing better than zero or a hundred percent. So, so that's the first thing is, is don't, don't be afraid to try because what happens is that as you try, there's some really wonderful things that come from taking those stabs at it. Number one is that you're motivated to figure out how to get better at it. That, that's the first thing. So that you're, you're really thinking about as your life is unfolding, like how, how is my experience informing the way that I'm thinking about these probabilities so that you can start to narrow those ranges down. You, you now have a motivation to try to improve. Number two, you become super, super information hungry. Because in order for me to narrow those probabilities down, obviously, the more information that I have, the better off I am. So if, like if you're thinking about the college decision, you're much more likely to be going through like, what are my values? What are the things that I think I'm going to like? Let me try to make some sort of ordered list from most important to less important of the things that I think are really important for me to, it, to have in a college. And then let me really research the college. Instead of just going and visiting and it happens to be a sunny day, right? <laughs> so ooh, I liked it. Uh, let me actually think about where, where does the college fit with what my values are. So, and, and you're going to be more likely to talk to other people who have experienced that college. You might actually seek out people who didn't like the college to try to talk to them, which is something that you normally wouldn't do because you're really trying to get a sense now of how do I come up with the best guess, the best stab at how much I'm going to like this. So you become information hungry. The third thing that happens that I think is really good is that when you start to express yourself this way, you invite other people to tell you what they know, 
what their opinions are about it. Why they think that maybe your perspective needs to be calibrated. Information that they might have that they otherwise wouldn't share you with you. So think about it this way. If you're like, I want to go to this college, I'm 100% sure this is definitely where I want to go. And you know somebody who really didn't like that college, you're probably not going to tell me that. Because I already told you I made my decision. I already told you I'm 100% sure. Why would you want to make me sad by telling the story about your friend who really hated it and dropped out after six months? So you're now not sharing relevant information that would help me with my decision. But when I say to you, I'm thinking about this college and I'm like, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm 60% sure that I'm going to like it. Now you're going to tell me all the people who liked it and why they liked it and all the people who didn't, because I've invited you into this process in a way where the way that I've expressed myself ensures that you know that I'm not going to be defensive about the information that you're giving me, that I'm not going to think that you're attacking my beliefs or attacking my viewpoint. I am, I am signaling to you that I am open-minded. And if we know that a lot of the problem with decision-making that makes it different than chess and more like poker is that there's all these face down cards. There's all this information that we don't have. There's all this stuff that I don't know that you don't know because you've had different experiences than I do. I have, you have different hypotheses than I have. You think about the world in a different way than I do. So you have all this stuff that might be really valuable to me. I need to start to get those cards to be able, you know, to, to narrow down what's in those cards. And that means that I have to be getting as much information as I can. I have to reveal the unknown to myself as much as I can. And I can do that in the way that I express these kinds of probabilistic guesses to you. And that in turn is going to help me refine those guesses. And it's going to invite you in the process to work through it with me so that I now have collaborators and helpers in the process. That's awesome. So, you know, admitting your uncertainty from the, from the get go Mm -hmm. allows you to get more information, which allows you to refine your uncertainty and become more certain, you know, increase the probability. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, kind of, kind of counterintuitive. Right. I I just want to say, like, I think that this is a big problem for leadership, like leaders of teams. I, I think that a lot of people think, well, in order to really be believable to my team, in order for them to believe that I have the right to be leading them, that I need to be expressing things with certainty. And when you do that, a, a few things happen. W- one is that you, you end up actually creating a version of resulting, which is that once the leader has expressed their belief, people will reason toward that in the same way that they reason toward making an outcome make sense. So you've, you've created another kind of version of resulting, which is people will start to reason toward what the leader has, has stated as the absolute truth, number one. Number two, When they state things with certainty, people in the room are much, much less likely to share information that might be contrary to whatever the the opinion that's been expressed is. And there's two reasons why they might not do that. One is that they might feel like they're wrong. So if they're not 100% certain of their own beliefs, if they have any uncertainty themselves, if they think maybe we should be going a different way, but I'm like only 40% on that. They're not going to speak up for fear that people are going to, you know, that's going to be, you're wrong or you're disagreeable. Like, why are you disagreeing? You're wrong. Or they're, they're afraid of telling the leader that they're wrong. They're afraid of saying, no, I don't agree with you, that they're going to get in trouble for that. And so they tend to keep their mouth shut. But if a leader actually expresses things with some sort of modulation on the belief, they're much more likely to get people to speak up because then the person doesn't feel like they're not being a team player. You know, when the leader themselves said, I, I really, I really believe that this is, you know, the best possible way to go. You know, when I think about all of the things that could happen, I think this has a 70% chance of succeeding, you know, sort of compared to all the other ways that things could go. Just by saying that, now, if you have some belief that you're 40% on, you no longer feel bad about, you know, maybe disagreeing, you know, or going against what the tide is because I haven't expressed the tide as certain. No, yeah, I've definitely been in meetings where a leader will say, here's what I think, and then say, what do you all think? And no one says anything because, of course, you don't want to disagree with that guy. Yeah, so wouldn't it be great if the leader started with, hey, here's the problem, what do you guys think? Right. And they they kept their mouth shut. Now, they, you know, it's sort of that same thing of how do you stop from, you know, how do you actually get good decision process? Well, you know, quarantine yourself from the outcomes. As a leader, how do you get the best opinions in the room to express themselves? Quarantine the room from your beliefs. I love say, that. You say what you believe last. 
No, that that's a fantastic like brass tax tip people can start doing implementing today. One of the most profound things I got from this book that really hit me was, you know, particularly in this day and age of like just extreme polarization that we have. They use, one one way we can probably mod, moderate some of that is treating our opinions like bets. How can that help moderate our opinions? Well, so there's lots of opinions that people might have. And particularly in this day and age, and particularly when you can type it out in, I guess, 280 characters now in about three seconds without really thinking about it, you know, people seem very free to express their opinions with absolute certainty. So they just say, I know this is true. So let's think about what the framework of thinking about decisions as bets does. So what is a bet? A bet is a decision that's informed by your beliefs about the way that you think the future might turn out. So if I'm in a restaurant and I'm trying to decide between, you know, do I want to order the chicken or the fish? I have beliefs about what things I like in my past experiences and, you know, what I know about the restaurant and how they might, what their specialties might be and and such. And so my beliefs inform which future I think is going to be better for me, the future where I'm eating chicken or the future where I'm eating fish. And when I make a decision, I'm betting on, you know, let's say I decide to order the chicken. I'm betting that Annie eating chicken will be happier than Annie eating fish. So that's, that's, that's what a, a bet is. It's really, and, and that's what all decisions are, right? So I've just put decisions into the frameworks of bets. So when we're making decisions, we are actually betting. We just don't think about it explicitly. So what would happen if we started to think about that explicitly? Well, let's think about what happens when you express an opinion and someone actually challenges you to a bet. So, you know, for example, you know, let's say it's a couple of weeks ago and the stock market took a dive. Uh, you know, an 1100 point dive and you announce over the weekend, well, I think on Monday, the stock market's going to be at 400 points. So now I've just expressed that with certainty, right? What happens when someone says to me, well, do you want to bet on that? I mean, what would happen to you if I said to you, do you want to bet on that in that spot? I'd be like, "Mm, I'd do some hemming and hawing. Right. You would back off. Yeah. (laughs) So why would you, why would you back off? I mean, you just, you know, let's say that, I did that. And I said, I think it's going to go up 400 points. I mean, I just made a declaration, right? I mean, I just expressed something with total certainty. And if you say, want to bet to me, all of a sudden I'm like, well, actually, (laughs) I mean, I didn't really mean like, I'm sure that it's going to go up 400 points. I mean, I I could do a lot, you know, now all of a sudden I'm, you know, completely backtracking. And why am I backtracking? Because what your question has done to me by saying, want to bet is it's reminded me that there's risk in every decision that we make. That when when I make the decision to order the chicken versus the fish, there's risk in that. Because when I order the chicken, I'm foregoing all the other options that I have. And I'm investing, in this case, some money, time, happiness, health, enjoyment, all sorts of limited resources in that decision on, on the future that I've now directed myself toward. And so, so, so it's risky. So when I, when you say want to bet to me, you've reminded me of that. And now what happens is I go through this inventory where I think, well, why do I really think that? Like, what is my overall knowledge of the way that the stock market goes? Like, how much do I really know about this that I've just declared this? Uh, Maybe I should find some more information. Why might I be wrong? That's a really important question that makes you ask. Why might I be wrong? Here's another one. What does Brett know that I don't know? Why is he challenging me to this bet? So now it forces me to think about your perspective and think about what you might know that I don't know. Why I have to think about why would you be arguing against me? Because that's really what you're declaring. And all of those things actually cause me to do a lot of vetting of this belief or prediction that I've just declared with such certainty. So it, it backs me off and basically moves me into a place where I acknowledge the uncertainty in my beliefs. I acknowledge the er inherent uncertainty in any prediction that I make about the future. And that's a good place to be because we can't be certain. You know, our beliefs are rarely certain. Our predictions about the future can't be certain because luck intervenes. And so it actually puts us in a place where we are more accurately representing the beliefs that we have. We're more accurately representing the predictions that we might have. Now think about how wonderful that would be for Twitter. 
<laughs> you know, if before you posted anything on Twitter, you, you know, someone said to you, well, do you want to bet on that opinion? <laughs> right. I no, think that people would start saying, well, you know, I, I was thinking about this and, you know, I like sort of 60% believe this. Right. No, when I was uh, reading that, I was like, that'd be cool if someone made some sort of like Twitter plug-in where you had to, for every opinion you spouted off, you had to like put, you know, a few bucks on the line. I don't know. Crazy idea that I got. I think that'd be great. So listen, I think you should do that. Like, okay. Create an app. I will. No, sir, which is like, literally, it just stops and says like, do you want, would you be willing to bet on this belief? You know? Um, yeah. So, and ask how much. So, so like here, here's a really good, I, I think here's a really good example where I think the public would have been a lot better off if people were thinking through this frame. So in November of uh, 2016, you might recall that we had a presidential election. And I thought that there was this really interesting divide between the people who were looking at the polls, so that the people were actually doing these polls and sort of figuring out from that what, you know, what different futures might occur and the pundits. So, you know, when you're watching news programs on TV and the pundits are speaking, like their job is to deliver you the answer with certainty, right? Like they're supposed to express their certain opinion and they're certainly not supposed to waffle. I think, you know, sadly, a pundit who expressed things you know, as like, well, you know, I'm kind of 60% that, you know, I mean, like, when, if you said, like, what's the solution to, to school shootings, you know, wouldn't it be great if instead of a declaration about what it was, they were like, well, I, I think this strategy might be 20%. And this strategy might help things, you know, wouldn't that be wonderful, but no pundit is ever going to do that. Okay, so now it's the election, November 2016. And Nate Silver is looking at the numbers in the week before the election. And it seems to be bouncing between about 70% Clinton, 30% Trump, and 60% Clinton, 40% Trump. That's what his his analysis is, right? Because he's looking across all the polls and he's, he's, you know, sort of running his analysis. He has a model. And so that's what he's coming out with. And that translates when you're watching on TV to the pundits saying Hillary Clinton's going to win the election. So Nate Silver was acting much more like someone had asked him, do you want to bet on this? Because notice his opinion is quite modulated, whereas the pundits are not thinking about that. They're just trying to tell you who's going to win. And they've declared that it's Clinton. And of course, the people who you know, you're really hearing are the pundits. So what happens the next day when Trump wins the election? Everybody's in shock. And, and what are they saying? The pollsters are wrong. They got it wrong. Boy, these people, they don't know what they're doing with their polls. And even a year later, you're still hearing that when people talk about, oh, such and such is polling at such and such a place. You know, this election is polling this way. People will still refer back to November and they'll say, well, you know, I don't believe in polls. Polls are just wrong. Well, no, it, it's not that the polls were wrong. It's that the pundits were expressing what the data from the polls were telling them with certainty. They weren't expressing it like someone was saying to them, do you want to bet on it? Because here's the deal. I bet if somebody had said to one of those those pundits who declared, well, Hillary Clinton's going to win this election, hey, do you want to bet on it? I bet they would back off. Because if you looked at Nate Silver's data, it would be the exact same question as saying, here, I have a gun and it has 10 chambers in it and I have filled three to four of them <laughs> with bullets. So now, would you like to hold that to your head and pull the trigger? <laughs> and I'm guessing that they would say, well, actually, let me rephrase. I don't think Hillary Clinton's going to win. I think like most, you know, she's, she's, she's favored. <laughs> right, right. She's, she's going to win a lot of the time, but not all the time, which would have been the right reaction. So had that been communicated in that probabilistic way, wrapping the uncertainty into it in an effective way to the public, the public's reaction the next day would have been much better, you know, because they would have said like, oh, well, you know, he was going to win like 40% of the time. I guess that's not that surprising. And they would have stopped dismissing the expertise of the pollsters because pollsters really do have a lot of expertise. They're statistically quite adept. They wouldn't have been dismissing the, this group of experts as really not knowing what they're doing. And, and the other thing I think that's interesting is that if that had been communicated to the public, if any election were to get communicated to the public in that way, I think the public would be able to make much better choices about what their actions should be. So let's take, for example, a situation where people are just telling you that your preferred candidate is going to win 
then maybe you're not really working hard to make sure that candidate wins or that your preferred candidate is definitely going to lose. Again, maybe you're not working that hard to make sure that your preferred candidate doesn't lose. But if you express it as like 60-40, you know, now all of a sudden that's going to change the kinds of decisions that you make around how hard do you want to work on either side of the equation. You're going to have a much better sense of what the actual odds are. You know, is it really important for me to get out and canvas for my, you know, candidate? Do I think it's really going to make a difference? And it's going to change short, short, your decision structure in terms of what you do in front of the election as well if, if you think about those in a probabilistic way. So, I mean, I think that's just a really good example where you can see how not thinking about things, you know, is a construct of want to bet really mess things up. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this even today where, you know, you've heard people saying, oh, the polls were wrong. No, I, I love that. And I've been doing that ever since I read that little insight about thinking of your opinions as decisions and your decisions as bets, like giving like probabilities to my opinions. Like how sure am I, how sure am I about this opinion that I have? And yeah, it causes you to like realize, okay, I'm not actually, I'm not as sure as I think. And it forces you, as you said, to work a little bit harder so you get more information so you can refine that right. opinion even more. It, it makes you open Google up, right? Right. Yeah. Or talk to you, you know, it makes having a conversation about polarizing topics easier. You can tell people like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm at 60% on this. Like I feel this and like it opens up people. They're not going to like land blast you and just, they're going to modulate their opinion because they're going to, well, this guy isn't completely decided. We can have a conversation. And also I imagine that it doesn't feel to them like you're attacking their identity. Right. You're not saying you're wrong. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you're not saying you're wrong, which I think is like, I, I think that that's really the key. You're, you're basically signal, signaling to them, like, look, my belief is under construction, right? It's in progress. Can you help me with the progress? I, w- I would like to, you know, move my belief forward. I would like to be able to calibrate it. I'd like to be able to kind of get it right because it's in progress because I don't really know. And the fact is that, it, you know, when we think about decisions, all of our decisions are informed by the beliefs that we have. And so, the better the beliefs we have in the sense of the more accurate our beliefs are as a representation of the objective truth, the better our bets are going to be, the better our decisions are going to be. I think I say in the book, the person who wins in a bet is not the one who just knows their belief with certainty and processes of the world to make sure that whatever their prior beliefs are, are right. Meaning I just want to be right as opposed to true, which are two different things. So there's a difference between right and accurate. Right is like, I, I believe this thing and everything that I do is just to prove that, that, that thing that I believe, right? But that person's going to do very poorly in a betting situation because they're, they're not viewing their beliefs as under construction. So their beliefs are never going to progress. Their beliefs are never going to be calibrated to, you know, better calibrated to what the objective truth is. But the, the person who, you know, views their beliefs as in progress and has the goal of saying, I want to process the world in a way that makes my beliefs more accurate that person actually is going to do really well. So in order to do that, doing what you've started doing, which is, you know, well, you know, this is what I think is right, but I'm like 60% on it. That's the best step to making sure that you start to reason toward accuracy as opposed to toward rightness. I love that. Well, Annie, this has been a great conversation and there's so much more we could dig into. Where can people go to learn more about thinking and bets? Sure. Uh, Thanks for asking. So for, obviously you can go buy my book. (laughs) at your local bookstore or, you know, on Amazon or burnsandnoble.com or indie books or wherever. You can go to annieduke.com, which is my website. And there you'll find a few things. First of all, if you happen to want to hire me, you can hire me there. You can contact me there as well. But I also have a newsletter that I send out every Friday, which actually takes things that are happening out in the world. You know, a lot of current events, a lot of things that are you know, in the news during that week and looks at them through the, the lens of thinking and bets. So it's, it's a way for you to start seeing how you might apply the concepts of the book to things that are happening in the world. And, and if you go to annieduke.com, you can find archives of the newsletter to see if it's something that you like. And if you like it, you can subscribe there and it will hit your inboxes every Friday. And you can also find me on a variety of social media. I'm pretty active on Twitter. So you can go to at Annie Duke is my Twitter handle. And, uh, you know, I post stuff that I find interesting there. So 
You can find me in a bunch of places. Fantastic. Well, Annie Duke, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. My guest today was Annie Duke. Her book is Thinking in Bets. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash thinkinginbets, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.